some of the saints of God. We're here tonight to study God's word. If you have your Bibles tonight, if you will turn to Romans chapter 5, verses 12 through 17. And we're still in lesson number five, joy in the spirit. And the main ideal of this lesson is that a life of holiness is possible if you choose to yield to the Holy Spirit. And over the last three weeks or so, we've been dealing with the question, what areas of your life do you fail to yield to God? And we've been looking over some areas that we may all uh, fail to yield in. And we'll probably do a little background on that. And then we'll move forward to Romans chapter 5, verses 12 through 17. Again, this lesson is entitled Joy in the Spirit. Um, from Romans chapter 5, verse 12 through 17 is our background. And then our main scriptures will come from Romans 8, verse 1 through 4. Uh, just depends on how far we get tonight on what we cover. And if we don't cover it all tonight, we'll come back to it to next Tuesday. Um, if you have your um, song book, there's a song called In the Garden. Uh, I come to the garden alone while the dew is still on the, the roses. Uh, there's three verses of that song. Um, you may be familiar with the chorus, and he walks with me and he talks with me. Um, that's the song that we're going to sing tonight. Um, him in the garden. And so we'll take a look at that and then we'll come back with a brief prayer and go into uh, our study tonight from Romans chapter 5, verse 12 through 17. I come to the garden alone while the dew is still on the roses and the voice I hear falling on my ear, the Son of God discloses, and he walks with me, and he talks with me, and he tells me I am his own. And the joy we share as we tarry there, none other has ever known. He speaks and the sound of his voice is so sweet the birds hush their singing. And the melody that he gave to me within my heart is ringing. And he walks with me and he talks with me and he tells me I am his own. And the joy we share as we tarry there, none other has ever known. I stay in the garden with him, though the night around me be falling. But he bids me go through the voice of woe. His voice to me is calling. And he walks with me and he talks with me and he tells me I am his own. And the joy we share as we tarry there, none other has ever known. One more time, and, and 
he walks with me and he talks with me and he tells me I am his own and the joy we share as we tarry there none other has ever known Amen in the garden meeting with the Lord he he walks with me and he talks with me. Father, we come, we want to thank you tonight for being a true and living God who walks with us, who talks with us, who lives life through us for your own glory and purpose. And so we thank you that we have access to you uh, through Jesus Christ's sacrifice and through the indwelling Holy Spirit that lives within us. We thank you tonight, Lord God, that you've allowed us to assemble in this sacred place to worship you, the true, sovereign, and living God. And beside you, there is no other God. You are the one who created the heavens and the earth by your spoken command. And Lord, you hold all things in place to this very present day. And so we thank you for your great power. Thank you for your great authority. And Lord, we thank you for your love and your mercy toward us. We thank you that even while we were sinners separated from you because of sin, you sent your son in the likeness of men to die for our sins, to be buried and raised from the dead on the third day so that through him we may experience God's grace, God's mercy, and God's love and forgiveness. We also pray tonight, Lord, that you would forgive our sins, and Lord, we know that we have fallen short today, but we thank you that the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. Thank you that we have an advocate, one who goes between, one who bridges and stands in the gap, and that's Jesus, your son. And because he lives, Lord God, we can experience forgiveness and we can be restored uh, to right relationship and right fellowship with you through the sacrifice of your son. We also thank you for the Holy Spirit, the third person of the triune God that lives in us. We thank you, Lord God, that Jesus said, I will not leave you as orphans, but I will send a helper. The Holy Spirit will come and he will testify of me and he will not only uh, be with you, but he will live in you. And so we thank you for the indwelling presence of your spirit in us tonight, Lord. And so we pray tonight that you would be with those in our midst, Lord God, who may be tired, who may be uh, physically worn, who may be uh, suffering from some illness or disease or affliction. We pray, God, that you would sustain them, that you would strengthen them, that you would heal them. Do it according to your own glory, your own will and purpose for each of our lives, Lord. And then, God, we ask that you would... Uh, Forgive our nation, Lord. Uh, we know that as a nation, Lord, we have left your precepts. We've left your commands. And we ask that you would have mercy on us as a nation. Be merciful toward our leaders, uh, those who have um, guide and uh, direct this nation, Lord. And, and sometimes they're not in the right, Lord. And we ask that you would be merciful to them and help them, Lord God, to submit to your leading, to your spirit so that they may rule and govern this nation in a way that glorifies and honors you that will point people to Christ and so we pray tonight that Lord that you will meet us in your word as we study um, dealing with life in the spirit be with us be our teacher be our guide in Jesus name amen, amen. amen. Oh, again I want to say thank y'all for coming out tonight thank everyone who is watching by way of Facebook and YouTube tonight. We're still on lesson number five, joy in the spirit. And again, the main ideal of this lesson is that a life of holiness is possible if you choose to yield to the Holy Spirit. So that the only way that we can please God in the flesh, in the body, is that we yield to God's Holy Spirit that is in us.
And over the last three weeks or so, we have been asking the question, what area in your life have you failed to yield to God, to surrender to God? And we looked at some of the areas of such as finances, uh, maybe uh, we say, well, it's my money, uh, I'll work for it. Uh, but we discover that uh, God is the one who gives us the ability to get well. Uh, and so it's, we're actually a steward of what God has blessed us to have. Uh, and some of us may struggle and we have not yielded the area of finances to God. Uh, maybe it's in sexual purity, where we talked about where the Bible says that we have been bought with a price and we no longer belong to ourselves, we are to glorify God with our body and with our spirit, which are the Lord's. And so he said, well, it's my body. Uh, just like the old song says, it's, it's my thing. I can do what I want to do. You can't tell me who to sock it to. But God says your body is, is the dwelling place of his Holy Spirit as a believer. And so that your body don't belong to you. God has a plan for your body. He's, he has redeemed you, and then one day he's going to raise your body up, your corrupted body, which would decay in the grave if um, Jesus tarries in coming back, or your body will be changed in a moment in a twinkling in an eye if we are caught up in the rapture. Mm -hmm. And so your body belongs to God. Um, then we talked about, or oh, have we submitted to God in the area of being content, you know, do we still long for more? We're not satisfied with what God has given us. And Paul sitting in a jail cell writing in Philippians chapter 4, 10 and 13, where he says, I've learned in every situation worrying to be content. He said, I know what it is to have much. I know what it is to have little. He says, in everything and all things, I have learned to be content. And so maybe you're not a content person. You always desire more. Uh, and some people don't get no rest. Uh, they, um, they ought to be what uh, resting while they're working. And, uh, and then they go to uh, work to rest. <laughs> go to sleep while they're there because they just overwhelmed. They feel like they got to have the next big thing, the next big TV, the next big house, the next big car, the next big piece of jewelry. Uh, and so they're not content. Uh, and so what about giving? Uh, have you surrendered the area of giving to God? Well, you says, well, God, this belongs to you. And God, I give you a portion back to you. Well, we talked about Luke uh, chapter um, uh, 638 talks about give and it will be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over with me and pour into your bosom. Um, and we talked about uh, 1 Timothy 6, 17 through 19, where Paul says, Warn those who are rich in this world uh, to be generous in giving, uh, sharing um, with the poor. And so we ought to be givers uh, rather than hoarders. Then we also talked about, I believe last week, uh, have we surrendered the area of forgiveness to God? Uh, are we still holding on to uh, grudges. Somebody did you wrong a year ago and you still can't meet with them. You still can't stand to be in their presence and you are wallowing in, in this spirit of unforgiveness. Um, you know, Peter asked the Lord, Lord, how many times shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Seven times? And Jesus said, not what? Seven times, but 70 times seven. And we saw that Jesus tells a parable about what a, a man who was called in by his um, master and said, hey, make an account of your stewardship. Uh, the scripture says the man owed his master what millions of dollars and he couldn't pay and he begged for mercy and the master forgave him the whole debt. And then this rascal went and found somebody. I think Brother Bobby alluded to that. He went and found somebody who owed him just a thousand dollars. And he grabbed him by the neck, violently began to choke the man and said, pay me what you owe me. And the man in the same way said, be merciful to me and I will repay. But he didn't, re he didn't give the man any mercy. He had him thrown into debtor's prison. And then the other servants heard what this man had done and went back and told the master. And the master said, I forgave you all your debt. Couldn't you do the same for your fellow man? Now you're going to prison also. 
right? Because this man had a greater debt than the, the man who owed him money, right? And so we, the conclusion of that, Jesus said now, and likewise, will your father also do to you that if you don't forgive your brother from your heart? In other words, you're the one that's in prison when you don't forgive. Uh, this man was angry. He was bitter. He was mer lacked mercy. And then he began to what reap what he had sown. And he was thrown into prison. So have you yielded um, forgiveness over to God? Well, you say, God, it's hard. They hurt me. And God understands that you were hurt. He saw what they did. But yet instead, what, what does God do daily for us? Forgive us every day, right? And then we talked about um, what about trust in God? Have you yielded your life? to trust in God? Are you anxious and worried about your life? And we looked at Matthew chapter 20, Matthew 6, 25 through 34, where Jesus said, don't worry about what you'll eat, what you'll drink, or what you'll wear. Your father knows what you need, but seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all that you need will be added to you. And then we went to Matthew 4, verse 6 through 9, where Paul was saying, here's the remedy for worry. Be anxious for nothing, but by prayer and supplication, make your requests known to God. And God's peace will put a garrison around your heart as you wait upon Christ Jesus. And so uh, these are just some of the areas um, that we need to yield to God daily. You know, you may be doing in these area is good today, but then a trial may come tomorrow and you may find yourself in a state of where you need to forgive or you need to share or you need to what um, um, uh, exhibit sexual purity. You may be tempted like Joseph. You're minding your own business and all of a sudden uh, someone sees you and they're attracted to you and they, they throw the line down on you, right? Like they did in Genesis 39, when Potiphar's wife saw Joseph in the house, minding his own business, taking care of his uh, affairs, and his Potiphar's wife came to Joseph and said, come sleep with me, Joseph. Uh, <laughs> one translation, one pastor says, she was saying, sex now. <laughs> that's, the, that's the rendering of the text. Sex now, Joseph. <laughs> no hanky-panky, no foreplay sex now. <laughs> and so uh, you be saying, oh, that's my lucky day. <laughs> but Joseph said, no, that ain't my lucky day. He says, hey, you're married, and this would be a sin against God. And so just because we're doing good in these areas now, it don't mean that we won't be tempted in these areas uh, later in life. And so uh, these are areas that we need to submit or yield to God's Holy Spirit in order for us to live a holy life. And so the teaching aim is to, to lead a ducks to learn that a spirit-filled Christian says yes to the impulses of the Holy Spirit. And so when the Holy Spirit fills you, you are to say yes to the leading of God's Spirit. And so tonight we want to move a little bit further in, in uh, this study, Joy in the Spirit. Our background scripture comes from Romans chapter 5, verses 12 through 17. And there is this contrast uh, between death in Adam and life in Christ, right? And, uh, and so that's just to kind of give an overview of what the scripture text is about. It's contrasting what Adam did and how Adam's one action affected the whole entire human race. But in contrast, it also talks about Christ's life and his sacrifice and how it can affect the whole human race to those who come to him in faith. Uh, and so let's take a look at our background scripture tonight. Uh, Romans chapter 5, verses 12 through 17. And then that will lead us in context to Romans chapter 8. So let's take a look at 
what Romans chapter 5, 12 through 17 says, if I can get someone to read that, and then let's take a look, look at the text. Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world, and death by sin, and so death passed upon all men, for all have sin. For until the law, for until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed. There is no law. Nevertheless, uh, death reigned, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over them that had not sinned after him. 17. Of Adam's transgression, who is the figure of him that was to come. But not as the offense, so also is the free gift. For if thou for if through the offense of one many be dead, much more the grace of God and the gift by grace, which is by one man, Jesus Christ, have abounded unto many. And not as it was by one that sinned, so is the gift. For the judgment was by one to condemnation, but the free gift is of many offenses unto justice. 17. For if by one man's offense death reigned by one, much more they which receive abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness shall reign in the life of life by one Jesus Christ. Thank you, Brother Bob. So let's let's point out some um, some contrasting statements. Um, we're looking at Adam. And we're looking at Jesus, right? And so as we look at verses 12 through 17, let's take a look at Adam. What, what, some, what, what are some of the things that Paul state that Adam brought into the world uh, by sinning? Death. He brought death. Oh. What else did he bring? So he brought sin into the world as well, right? What else did he bring? Just concentrate on the verses that talk about Adam. So he brought death into the world. He brought sin into the world. What else, when we look at Adam, uh, what did he also bring? Well, Paul, Paul says that we know that by keeping law did not bring salvation. Yes, ma'am. And so Adam brought death. He brought sin. What else do we see in verses 12 through 17 that Adam brought? Not Adam. <laughs> he brought transgression. In other words, he broke God's law, right? He transgressed against God's law. So what did Christ bring? So that, and now we contrast, what do we get from Christ? Free gift. Okay, the grace of God. Gift of righteousness. Eternal life. Okay, eternal life, the gift of righteousness. So let's let's kind of go back now. So we understand that Adam brought death, right? And then Christ brings what? Life, new life, right? So therefore, just as through one man, talking about Adam, there was only one man, on the face of the earth at this time, it was Adam. Uh, the Bible says that God took the what the the, um, the dust of the earth and formed it into a man, and God breathed into his nostrils, and the man became a living soul. Right, and then God placed a man in a perfect environment, 
called the Garden of Eden. God gave him a job. His job was, was to what? Till the garden, take care of the garden. His job was to what? Name the animals that God gave. And when he was functioning in his relationship with God, the scripture says, and then God said, it's not good for the man to be alone. But before God gave Adam a wife, God gave Adam one rule. He says, uh, God told him what now? Uh, instruction not to eat off the forbidden fruit. Okay. There was a, some trees in the middle of the garden. One was called what the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. One was called the tree of life. And God told Adam, you may freely eat of all the trees in the garden except the tree in the middle of the garden, which is what the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Mm -hmm. You are not to eat of that tree. And the day you eat of that tree, you shall surely die, right? And so Adam didn't experience physical death right offhand. I was sharing with some of the brothers earlier that Adam lived to be about 920 years old. Uh, but he experienced separation from God, which is spiritual death. And so we're in Adam. Adam is our representative. He's our only human representative at this time. And so, therefore, just as through one man, sin entered the world. And so God had placed Adam in a perfect environment. He had fellowship with God. And then God gave him a command not to eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And uh, the day you eat of this tree, you will surely die. Well, God creates woman for man, right? Because it's not good for the man to be alone. I will make him a suitable helper, right? And when God made a suitable helper, he made someone opposite of Adam. He didn't make another man because another man is not suitable for a man to marry, to sleep with. You can't procreate and have babies if you sleep with another man. Uh, and so God made a woman, right? The scripture says that God took uh, from Adam's side and, and God what fashioned from that rib out of Adam's side a woman and brought the woman to the man. And Adam said, this is now bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, for she was taken out of man. And I think I did a word study one time on the word uh, Adam and Eve. And, and the word Adam means ish and the word Eve means isha. So that's how you get uh, Marquisha out of, <laughs> out of that. So Adam means Ish and E means Isha. So yeah, Ish and Isha in the garden, right? And so they're, hum they're the human representatives of the whole entire world. Mm -hmm. they're, they are our what? Our ancestors. Um, and so they represent the entire human race. Uh, and so that day came in Genesis chapter 3, where the scripture says, And the serpent, who was more crafty than any other beast that the Lord God had created, came and said to Eve, Has God said that you may eat from the trees in the garden? She said, Well, God says we can eat from every tree in the garden except the tree in the middle of the garden. And we are not to eat of that tree, nor touch that tree, for if we eat of that tree, we shall surely die. And he said, you won't die. You'll be like God, knowing good and evil, right? Mm -hmm. And so all, since that time, man has been questioning what God said. God says it's an abomination for a man to lie down with a man like he lies down with a woman, mm -hmm. right? But we're coming back to the table and says, has God really said that? And, and, and if he did, who cares about what God said? That's an old foggy stuff, man. God is just trying to keep me from having fun, right? God is trying to keep me from loving who I really want to love, right? But when God says something, if he prohibits something, God is looking out for your good. Just like you tell your kids and grandkids, don't play in the street. You're not prohibiting their fun, <laughs> you extending their life because God wants you to live, right? And, and, and so when God says no, he says, I'm protecting you, right? And so the devil told Eve what she wanted to hear. You won't die. You'll be like God, knowing good and evil. And the scripture says, and the woman 
saw the tree, looked at the tree, saw that it was good for food, pleasant to the eyes, and, and good for making one wise, she eats of that tree. Now, the Bible don't say it was an apple. It don't say it was a plum, a peach. It don't say what it was. It said it was a tree of the knowledge of good and evil. She ate of that fruit, and she gave some to her husband who was with her. And their eyes were open, and they knew that they were naked, and they hid themselves from God in the garden. And they took fig leaves to cover themselves, right? Mm -hmm. And then God comes into the garden and says, Adam, where are you? He says, I hid myself because I was naked. And God said, well, who told you that you was naked? Well, if you read the end of the chapter before they sinned, the scripture says, and the man and the woman were both naked and they were not ashamed. So sin now brings separation because the scripture says Adam and Eve hid themselves from one another and they hid themselves from God and then they're ashamed and the knowledge that they said they would have now they wish they didn't know because it brought what the knowledge of sin right but who was contributed with the sin according to this verse in Romans and in Adam all sin so the sin was not contributed to Eve even though Eve ate first. Why was the sin not contributed to Eve? Because he gave Adam the And he was the head of his family, right? So God holds the head accountable. And so when you got these little wayward rascals running around here, <laughs> can't nobody say nothing to them, can't nobody sit them down, can't nobody discipline them, God holds you accountable. You're the head. And so man is being is the head of the of the family. Um, man is should be the head of the church. And, we, and, and many women don't agree with that because um, the question was um, brought up just this what week or so ago. Uh, can a woman be a pastor? Well, according to the scriptures, a woman can't be a pastor. Uh, the Bible says uh, if a man desires the office of a bishop. He desires a good work. 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 1 through 7. Also in Titus chapter what 1, I believe, talks about an elder. And so I heard a preacher say about a woman who's a pastor. She says, now at home, her husband is the head. But when he goes to church, his wife is over him. That's out of order. That's not God's design for the church nor for the family. And so Adam was what a charge with this sin. The Bible says that Eve was deceived. Remember what she said when God asked her, what have you done? She says, the serpent deceived me and I was eight. Now was Adam deceived? No. Adam wasn't deceived. The scripture says, and he, the woman gave some to her husband who was with her. Now, Adam had, at that time could have said, I'm not going to eat. God said we were not to eat from that tree. Sorry, Eve. <laughs> but what, what he did, though, um, he, he, he yielded his authority as the head of the human race over to his wife. And remember what God said the consequences would be for the man and for the woman. He says, now, Adam, you will have to what now work the, uh, the land to bring about is what produce for you, uh, thorns and thistles it will what uh, produce for you, uh, and you will work the ground until you what return to the ground. From out of the ground you were taken, and out of the ground you shall return. He told the woman, um, you will now have what labor in your childbearing. And he told her, and your desire will be to master your husband but he shall rule over you. So the constant struggle of um, man uh, trying to dominate the woman, the woman trying to be the head over the man, mm -hmm. when they are supposed to submit to one another mm -hmm. in godly fear, right? Mm -hmm. And so Adam was charged with this sin of disobedience to God because the scripture says, therefore, just as through one man, 
sin entered the world. Now, what is sin? By definition, by your definition, what is sin? Wrongdoing. Wrongdoing. Disobeying God. Because God was the one who gave the command not to eat, right? So sin is what? Disobeying God. And so Adam, when he submitted to eating the fruit that the, his wife gave him, he was more mindful of his wife than he was about God, right? Have you ever yielded to man and not to God? You wanted to fit in? Um, you compromised your convictions, your beliefs, uh, and you submitted? You, you said, well, everybody gets drunk every now and then, everybody smokes every now and then, everybody steals a piece of candy every now and then, ain't nobody perfect. And we begin to what? Rationalize with sin. And, and that's what happens. Uh, therefore, just as through one man, sin entered the world. In other words, there was a perfect environment, absent of sin until Adam brought it into the world. Adam brought sin into the world. And the scripture says that not only did he bring sin into the world, and guess what? Death was his consequence. Romans what 6 and 23 says, for the wages of sin is death. So the consequences of Adam's disobedience brought death to where we are now separated from God, right? Because now we have to be what born again to enter into God's kingdom. So the, the nature of Adam passed on to us, the human race, the entire human race. Nobody escaped um, sin nature except for Christ because Christ was born of a virgin and he was conceived by the Holy Spirit, right? And so, but all of us have a sinful nature passed on to us by our parents and ancestors. Even David says, in sin did my mother conceive me and bring me forth. And so that little rascal that's in your belly <laughs> is already has a sinful nature, already depraved and alienated from God uh, at conception because Adam brought sin into the entire human race. And then the consequence for Adam's sin was death. So therefore, just as through one man, sin entered the world and death through sin. And so death is the consequences for sin. And thus death spread to all men, right? And you would say, that's not fair. I didn't sin, Adam sin. Well, have you sinned since Adam <laughs> <laughs> so God doesn't um, equate Adam's um, sin because um, you're a sinner too. You, you, you may not have done the same sin that Adam did and Adam violated the uh, direct command of God, right? We don't, in other words, so my sin is not the same as Adam's, but I'm a sinner, right? And the scripture says, and, death, and thus death spread to all men because all sin. And so you can't say, well, no, I'm not a sinner. Not me. You know, um, I may do some wrong things. You can call it whatever you want. My bad, my wrong. But God sees it as sin, right? Uh, willful disobedience. Uh, we sin by choice and we sin by nature. We sin by choice. Don't nobody make you sin. Nope. Uh, while I'm there, let's go to James. We sin by choice. Because, and we also sin by nature. So let us go to the book of James, which is near the end of the Bible. Mm -hmm. 
Let's go to James chapter 1. We'll start with verse 12. And we'll read to verse 15. James chapter 1, starting with verse 12 down to verse 15. Blessed is the man that endures temptation. For when he is tired, he shall receive the prayer of life, which the Lord has promised to give unto love. Let no man say when he is tempted, I am tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempted he be any man. But every man is tempted. When he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. Then, when lust has conceived, it brings forth sin. And sin, when it is finished, bringeth forth death. Do not ever, my beloved brother. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above and cometh down from the Father of light, with whom is is no variation, variance, neither shadow of turning. Okay, so let's stop there. So, James is saying, Bless is the man or the woman who endures temptation, right? We, we discovered in 1 Corinthians 10 13, it says, No temptation has overtaken you except what is common to man. In other words, we're all uh, going to be tempted, just like Adam and Eve were tempted in the garden. They could have stood on the word of God, right? Yes. And so they can't say, well, God knew that I couldn't withstand that temptation. <laughs> Bless is the man who endures temptation, for when he has been what approved, tested, or tried, he will receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him. So if I love God and God gives me the power to say no to sin, I am to what not submit to temptation, but I am to submit to God in the midst of that temptation, right? And so the Bible is saying here, let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God. God put this in my path. God knew this is my weakness, right? I'm tempted by God. Uh, well, God didn't tempt Adam and Eve to eat of the, the fruit of the tree, did he? Where did the temptation come from? It came from the devil, right? Satan himself. But Satan only plays on your what? Your desires. Because the scripture says, let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, right? And so God uh, cannot be tempted to do wrong. So therefore, he will not tempt you to do wrong. Now, God will test you. Uh, there's a difference between being tempted and being uh, tested. In Matthew chapter, I believe, 4, after Jesus receives uh, baptism by John the Baptist, the scripture says, and Jesus was led by the spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. So even though he was being led by the spirit, the spirit was not leading Jesus into temptation. Uh, the, he knew that the devil would tempt Jesus. And when Jesus was tempted in these areas of the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes and the pride of life, guess what Jesus did to come back the temptations? Everybody recall what Jesus did every time he was tempted by the devil? He quoted scripture. It is written. Man shall not live by bread alone. It is written. You shall not test the Lord your God. It is written. Um, you shall have no other God before him, right? And so Jesus stood on the word. Now Adam could have stood on the word, didn't he? Eve could have stood on God's word, but they didn't. And so the scripture says, let no one say when he or she is tempted, I am tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he what himself tempt anyone. 
Remember what it says in 1 Corinthians 10, 13, no temptation has overtaken you except what is common to man. But God is faithful and he will not allow you to be tempted above what you're able. And with the temptation, he will provide a way to escape, right? And so with every trial, with every temptation that you and I face in life, God is available and God is what? Faithful to lead you out of that temptation. We can follow God's way out or we can go to the next step here in James. But each one is tempted when he or she is drawn away by his own desires and tempted or enticed. So there's something on the inside of us which is called a sinful nature that's desiring something something that we don't have, something we want. The Ten Commandments up here talks about what? Thou shall not uh, covet. We should not covet our neighbor's wife. We should not covet our neighbor's um, what um, servants. We should not covet anything that belongs to our neighbor, right? And so here is this desire for something that we don't have. And we covet for it, we long for it, and we're willing to do whatever it takes to get it. And then the Bible says, but each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed. Then when desire, it starts with a desire. Then when desire it has conceived, it's kind of like giving a picture now of a woman uh, conceiving a child in her womb. Then when desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. We thought it would give birth to something desires, helpful and good, but all it does is give birth to sin. And when it's full grown, that is when sin is full grown, it brings forth death. Y'all see the picture? It starts with a human desire. And then we're enticed by it and we're doing whatever we take even to break the command of God. And we go our own way and we sin and then sin brings forth death. And that's what it brought forth to, um, to Adam. Eve thought it would bring life. Eve thought it would bring what um, knowledge, but it brought forth death, right? And so let's go back to Romans chapter 5 now. It says, verse 13, for until the law, sin was in the world. In other words, before God gave Moses the laws, the Ten Commandments and the Mosaic law, guess what? Sin was still at work in the world. So many people seem to think that we have to have a law to be sinners. But the scripture says before there was even a law, people were still sinning against God. Nevertheless, when there was no law, y'all see it? For until the law, sin was in the world, but sin was not imputed or counted when there was no law. In other words, if, if God didn't give a law that you trespassed against, then it was not counted as sin until the law came. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses. So even though there was no Mosaic law, there was no Ten Commandments, guess what? People were still dying because they were still sinning against God, even though there was no written law. Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses even over those who had not sinned to the likeness of the transgression of Adam. So they may not have sinned in the same way that Adam sinned, but they sinned, and guess what? The consequences for their sins was death. It says Adam was a type of him, that is a type of Christ, who was to come. 
So Adam was the, the head. Adam was a foreshadowing of Christ. Now, what Adam should have done what Christ did, and Christ what was obedient to God, right? And so look at uh, verse 15. But the free gift is not like the offense, the free gift of salvation, the free gift of grace. For if by one man's offense, that is talking about Adam's sin, many died much more the grace of God and the gift by the grace of God of the one man. Still talking about one man. Now, the one man, Adam, brought us into what? Sin. Brought death upon us. That one man's actions. Now, can one man's actions make a difference? In this? Yes, right? Adam, one man, brought condemnation. He brought judgment. He brought sin. He brought death. But what did Christ bring? Christ was one man. And the scripture says, for if by one man's offense, that is Adam's sin, many died, much more the grace of God and the gift by the grace of the one man talking about Jesus Christ abounded to many. So Adam's one sin brought death condemnation but God's son Jesus Christ who obeyed God brought what justification brought life uh, brought the grace of God verse 16 and the gift is not like that which came through the one who sinned the judgment for the judgment which came from one offense resulted in condemnation what does it mean to be condemned when somebody condemns you? You're guilty. So condemnation deals with the verdict of being guilty, right? Uh, Adam was guilty of transgressing against God by eating from the tree. So Adam brought condemnation, the divine guilty verdict. And then Christ brought justification. Now, we were condemned in Adam, but in Christ we're justified. In other words, it's a legal term that means that we are made right. We're declared not guilty. God saw us as guilty sinners in Adam. But in Christ, God sees us as justified through the blood and the sacrifice of, of Jesus, right? So on Adam's account, we're condemned sinners, experiencing death and separation from God. But on Christ's account, even though we are condemned, even though we're still sinners, Christ, God sees us as what justified. He declares us legally as if we never sinned, even though we are sinners. And if you don't think you're a sinner, just ask your neighbor. Neighbor, am I a sinner? <laughs> <laughs> and they was a child, yeah. <laughs> and so, so Adam brought condemnation, but the free gift, notice that it was a free gift, something that we did not earn, something we did not deserve, God gave to us in Christ. He gave us justification, according to verse 16. For if by the one man's offense, Death reigned through the one. You know, death reigned. The Bible says from Adam to um, uh, Moses, death reigned because all were sinners. And guess what? Death is reigning in the world today for those who are not in Christ, right? People are dying every day. There was a stat that talks about how many people who die every day. Millions of people die every day as a consequence of Adam's sin. We, we're, we're in Adam um, before we get saved. Uh, but now that we are saved and have trusted in Christ and experienced the grace of God, um, Jesus said um, in John chapter 11, I am the resurrection and I am the life. He that dies 
He that believes in me, though he dies, yet shall he live. And he that what lives and believes in me shall never die. Do you believe this, right? Even though we may experience physical death, Jesus said, yet and still, you will live eternally, right? You have eternal life because of my sacrifice, because of my death and resurrection. For if by the one man's offense, Adam's offense, death reigned through the one, much more those who would receive abundance of grace. God continues to pour out his grace day after day and of the gift of righteousness. And so not only did we ex experience God's what grace, but guess what we also received according to verse 17, his righteousness. In other words, we are now in right standing with God. Not because of what we did, but because of what Christ did. Adam brought us into condemnation before God. And Christ came and offered himself to bring us in right relationship with God the Father. And so receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one, Jesus Christ. So there's only one who makes us right with God. And that's Jesus Christ. And so we have to be in Christ to be made right with God. And if we're not in Christ, we're still in our sins. Um, let's go to Ephesians. I think there's another scripture that talks about our state and our condition before we accepted Christ. We were still in our sins. Let's go to Ephesians chapter 2. And we'll read down to verse 10. Ephesians chapter 2 verses 1 through 10. And it talks about our former condition, our former state prior to us uh, being saved by the grace of God through faith in Jesus Christ. Ephesians chapter 2 starting with verse 1. Okay, thank you, sis. And so notice our former condition or, or the present condition of those who are not in Christ. And you, he made alive, right? Mm -hmm. Who were dead in trespasses and sins in which you once walked according to the what? Course of this world. According to the prince of the power of the air. Talking about Satan. Satan. That same spirit now works 
in the sons of disobedience. And so if we don't have the spirit of Christ, you have the spirit of, of what? Satan. The Bible talks about uh, Jesus told the uh, Pharisees, you are of your father, the devil. Right. And so those who are not saved, those who have not experienced the grace of God, those who have not put their faith in Christ, the scripture says they are sons of disobedience. Among also, we, talking about us as Christians, before we got saved, among whom also we all once conduct ourselves in the lust of our flesh, fulfilling the desires of the flesh and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath just as the others, or just as those who don't know Christ. But God, who is rich in mercy, because of his what great love, in which he loved us even when we were dead in trespasses. God made us alive. Yes, he did. For by grace you have been saved, right? So we're saved by the grace of God. Yes, we were just like people uh, who don't know Jesus. Uh, we used to have our full of the flesh, fill of the flesh, because we didn't know no better. We were yes. fallen. Uh, after Satan, but God saved us by his grace and brought us into a right standing with himself through the death of his son. And so we'll stop here tonight. We want to thank you for uh, joining us tonight in this study of dealing with the background of our living life in the spirit, that how we can have a, uh, a life of holiness if we yield to God's spirit. But it first talks to us about um, our former state, our former condition, that in Adam we all were sinners and uh, we have broken God's law. But in Christ, uh, we uh, receive God's forgiveness. Uh, we receive God's Holy Spirit so that now we can please God. And so we want to thank you for joining us tonight for this study. Lord, we will pick back up in uh, Romans chapter 8 uh, on next week. Uh, we ask that you would join us in person um, Sunday, 10 o'clock, Sunday school, 11 o'clock morning worship. Until that time, may the Lord richly bless you and keep you is our prayer.